Amnon Shashua, Mobilize CEO. What is it that you're announcing this year at CES? What is the progress that you've made in the last 12 months? Uh, we announced uh, several new partnerships on mobility as a service in uh, South Korea, the city of uh, Daegu, in Paris uh, with RATP, we are uh, launching 2022, uh, uh, deploying mobility as a service uh, in, in Paris. Uh, we announced also uh, a deal with the Shanghai Automotive in China for uh, data collection, uh, for mapping, for HD mapping using uh, ADAS enabled uh, vehicles. Those are the big announcements. Uh, but we also put uh, on uh, YouTube a clip showing our autonomous car in the heart of Jerusalem. Very, very difficult, uh, challenging scenarios of driving using a vehicle powered only by, by cameras. So tell me about that vehicle. It's a vehicle that you develop. What kind of data is the vehicle gathering? How does it navigate its way through the city? Well, it, it's, a, it's part of a concept that we have, which we call true redundancy, where we're building two separate streams. One stream is only camera enabled. So we have a vehicle with 12 cameras, four parking cameras and eight long range uh, cameras. Uh, feeding information to a single IQ5 chip, which is our latest uh, system on chip. And this car has the ability to drive autonomously end to end. There's no other sensors in the car. Then we have another separate car, which has no cameras, just LADARs and, and radars, performing the same kind of uh, performance. And then at the end of the development, we'll put them to, together to create redundant uh, systems. And what we showed in this clip, that just with the cameras, we can handle driving scenarios that are challenging even for a human driver. When we talk about ADAS, we're talking, of course, about advanced driver assistance systems. In other words, the technology that is behind self-driving. What is it that, that you are doing that is different to your competitors, your direct competitors, but also different to other names out there like Waymo, like Cruise? Because when people hear self-driving, it, it, it could mean any number of things. It's an abstract term to a lot of people. So I think that there are three areas that separates us from, from, from the crowd. The first one is about a model of safety. We, uh, um, we published a paper two years ago about how to formalize the common sense of uh, human driving, how to define what dangerous situation is in the context of decision making on, on merging into uh, traffic. And since then we have been working with regulatory bodies to standardize uh, this model. Uh, we are the only company that is really transparent about its safety, safety uh, model. That's one element. The second element is about data. We have a crowdsourced technology using vehicles that have ADAS uh, systems on them. We're talking about millions of uh, vehicles. Those vehicles, they send us data. The data goes into the cloud and we build high definition maps automatically. And then we have other business uh, uh, opportunities using this uh, data, not only for autonomous driving. And the third, and I think most important distinguishing element is that we're not LIDAR-centric. We, uh, we, we have this concept of two separate uh, streams, one just cameras and the other one LIDARs and radars, such that these systems are, uh, are redundant. Where, whereas our competitors, they start with a 360 LIDAR, that's a kind of the common school of thoughts, and then they complement it with additional sensors like, uh, like cameras. The advantage of being able to do, to be camera centric, to have a stream only with cameras, because then it applies also for driving assist, for ADAS. It creates a uh, better and robust uh, system by having uh, redundant uh, systems. And uh, we can get the performance, which is much better than just a leader centric uh, system. Along with some partners, you are working towards a fleet of robo taxis for want of a better expression. What's the timeline on that? When will we see that become reality? So, so we have a number of joint ventures. Um, the one that we made public a few months ago was joint venture with Volkswagen uh, to uh, commercially deploy uh, robotaxi in Tel Aviv to early 2022. There'll be about 200 uh, robotaxi uh, vehicles, means without a safety driver, completely aut autonomous and we are working diligently on meeting that uh, timeline, so early 2022. In parallel, we'll be launching in China, together with uh, NEO. In parallel, we'll be launching in Paris with RATP. In parallel, we'll be launching uh, the city of Diego in uh, South uh, Korea, also a mobility as a service. You mentioned it earlier. What kind of role does regulation play 
in this timeline. You have different jurisdictions. You mentioned a few of them there. You said you were engaged with regulators. What do you think the kind of regulator approach is to self-driving as it stands today? Well, I, I think that the, the regulatory element is the most critical element there is in making a self-driving car a reality. Because without regulatory support, it's almost impossible to put a machine on the road that can kill people, that can put, it can save a lot of lives, but also put people in, 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 in danger. The fact that we can engage with regulatory bodies on a model of how the decision making of the car works in a transparent way allows us to take risks, allows us to build a system which is agile, that the decision making of the car emulates the way a human driver would drive in congested uh, traffic. And, and this is critical because the first line of business for autonomous cars is going to be robot taxis. Now imagine a consumer hailing a taxi. You'll never hail a taxi knowing in advance that this taxi is going to take twice as time to reach its destination. It has to be convenient. Yeah, it has to be convenient, it has to be efficient. But efficiency requires taking risks. So you must engage with regulatory bodies on how you balance between safety and usefulness. Because ultimate, safe, ultimate safety is when a car doesn't drive. Right? So you have to balance usefulness and, and safety. And this requires a model. We call this regulatory science. Uh, we're talking about mathematical models that regulate the way the decision making of the car uh, takes uh, place in a way that is transparent and open to society, in a way that you can engage with regulatory bodies, in a way that's technology neutral, doesn't benefit any particular actor, it will not benefit us more than it will benefit Waymo or Zooks or anyone else in this, uh, in this space, but it will benefit everyone a Equally. level playing field, It's a level playing field, exactly. One of the big themes of CES this year that struck me was not necessarily the hardware going into modern day vehicles, be they electric vehicles or anything else, but the data generated by cars. And it's not just yourselves. You see a number of people here at CES really focused on that data. But what I want to ask you about is how do you as a business monetize that big pool of data that's generated by vehicles when you, when you do think about mobility as a service? Well, for, first we, we need to define what, what data means. And, and the easiest way to think about it is you have a camera in the car. You know, most new cars today have a front-facing uh, camera for driving assist. So imagine this camera as an intelligent agent because it has a powerful chip, powerful software behind the camera that can understand the, the, the scene, understand where, what pedestrians are doing, cyclists, other road users, traffic signs, traffic lights. So it can take notes, just like any intelligent uh, creature. And those notes about, you know, there are potholes on the road, uh, the lane mark is, is washed, the traffic sign has fallen down, a tree has fallen down, somebody's being mugged. You, you can, you know, you can be open with your imagination. What an intelligent uh, actor can, can, what kind of notes an intelligent actor can take. And all this information goes to the cloud and now you can create all sorts of business models that help the Commonwealth, help smart cities, uh, help uh, traffic uh, congestion, uh, dynamic data, stationary data, uh, uh, asset uh, monitoring, uh, where there are potholes, where there are cracks on the road. So uh, you go and fix the crack before it becomes a problem, before other road users you know, damage, their, uh, damage their vehicles. These kinds of things exist today but in a very small, small manner. Actual humans go and make notes. But if you have every car automatically makes these notes, you are creating a revolution, a data revolution, which is powered by nothing really. The camera's already in the cars, the software is already there. All what you need to do, just send information to the cloud and process it in the cloud. So, so who's best placed then to, to capitalize on this, to, to basically build this market? Is it Mobileye or is it a cloud player like AWS? You know, what is it about your business that, that makes you believe that you can really jump on this opportunity to monetize car-generated data? I think we're the only actor that is doing that. We're talking high-level data. So we announced four years ago the technology of using ADAS-enabled vehicles to capture data, but it's not raw data. We extract vital information from the scene about landmarks, lanes, uh, pedestrians, other road users, such that it's very, very small bandwidth, about 10 kilobytes per kilometer. 
sent to the cloud, and in the cloud we build high definition maps, for example, automatically. I think no other actor in our business has this kind of uh, technology. And today we receive about six million kilometers per day from uh, companies like uh, BMW, Volkswagen, uh, Nissan. We have contracts with six car makers that by 2022 will have 14 million cars sending this kind of data. Why do the automakers themselves not take ownership of the data? So you sell them uh, a product, mobility as a service, ADAS, ADAS. Why do they not then act on that data themselves? Keep it for themselves. So uh, we are the actor that's generating this data and there's lots of IP and lots of know-how generating this data. We're, again, we're not talking about raw images being sent to the cloud because then the bandwidth would be huge. Uh, so our contracts with, with, with car makers, they have, uh, they have many interesting nuances. For example, there's issues of ownership of the, of the raw data that, that, that we send. There is a revenue sharing between us and, and the car makers. There are discounts on the ADAS technology that, that we install in the car for the right of receiving data. There are Got all it. sorts of different contracts which are uh, a win-win situation between us and the car makers. In 2019, before that 2018, one of the big themes was consumer data privacy, largely centered around our cell phones. But again, when we talk about connected cars, when we talk about EVs, other user data can make its way into the vehicle, out of the vehicle. How do you see consumers and drivers engaging with this idea that their car is generating increasing data? Well, I think compared to a smartphone, it's really negligible. All the data that's being sent from the car are anonymized. So what, what the, uh, the data, we don't know which, which car is sending uh, the data. The data is not about what the driver is doing, it's about what the scene looks like. So whether the lane marks, the traffic signs. Uh, so it, it really doesn't, doesn't do anything, doesn't compromise the privacy of, of, of the driver. And of course we comply with the GDPR, the European uh, uh, very strict uh, privacy rules as we and, and the car and the car makers. But again, compared to the smartphone data that's being collected about, collected on us, the consumers, here we're talking something that is really negligible in terms of uh, privacy. Intel speak glowingly about Mobileye, about Mobileye's contribution since that acquisition. But what does Intel mean for you? What, what is having a business and the resource of, resources of a business like that uh, as, a, as a partner, for want of a better expression, what does it mean for Mobileye about being able to go out and do your work? Well, well first, the, the strength of Intel now gives Mobileye the ability to, to think big, to think much bigger than, than we were in 2017. The, the, the notion of going into a mobility as a service, doing the service part, it's not just building the technology, the self-driving system technology, but actually doing a service, becoming an Uber or Lyft in the robotaxi area, we wouldn't have done it if we were just mobile. The fact that we have uh, uh, the spread of wings that Intel can provide us gives us this power. But also technologies. Right? We have divisions building uh, uh, very advanced uh, leaders for 2024 based on Intel's unique silicon photonics uh, technologies, the ability to put active and passive laser elements on chip. This, this comes from Intel. We have divisions that are building imaging radars, cutting edge imaging radars, also based on Intel technology. These are things that Mobileye did not have uh, before. We have access to, uh, to manpower that we didn't have uh, before. Hundreds of people that immediately joined Mobileye after the, the acquisition. We have the power of Intel in, um, in policy and government. All the activity on regulation is led, by, is led by Intel. We did the theory, we did the math, but Intel is doing the evangelization, promoting it uh, into, to regulatory uh, bodies. It's, it's an ideal combination of the two companies. On one hand, it's a merger that I think should be, uh, should be studied. It's a very, very successful merger. We're not just, it's not just hands off. We are still an independent company, but we receive a lot from Intel, but in a way that keeps our identity, keeps our uh, culture. I think it's one of those acquisitions that should be studied by everyone else. One of your competitors, Qualcomm, you know, their assertion is that they're bringing this cheap, low power silicon to the market. And it's that kind of stuff that's necessary to, to take something like this mainstream. What is it that's going to drive the adoption of these technologies to make them mainstream, to make them part of everyday life, everyday vehicles that consumers actually use? 
Well, yeah, we, we have a very unique silicon. I didn't talk about silicon because, you know, AV is much more than silicon. Our silicon is low power, is cheap. Uh, we, we ship just 2019 more than 17 million chips. So 17 million cars using our silicon on chip. So uh, if, we, if we talk about cheap and uh, lean and low cost, we are the king of cheap and, and low cost. But when you talk about autonomous vehicles, it's much more than the silicon. You have, you have the software, the algorithms, the validation, the, the, the safety uh, model, the fusion be uh, among uh, sensors, the decision making of, of the car, the sensing of the car, understanding the, 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 the environment. There are so many elements which go beyond what silicon you are, you, are, you are using. This is why I didn't talk about silicon, but we do have the best silicon on the planet. Let me ask you finally, 2020 seems to be a big year for lots of things, but let's just say for self-driving it will be a big year. What are you most excited about? What's to come in the next 12 months that you think will move the needle for this industry? I'm, I'm not sure that you know, I would mark 2020 as, as the turning point. I think 2022 is really the time where we can deploy these uh, systems without a driver in congested traffic and in, in challenging uh, environments not just you now Phoenix, Arizona. Can you understand consumer frustration though that at CES four years ago or CES two years ago that we were having similar conversations and you know. Not with us. And so we 2022 always, is a real exciting target. We've since 2016 said the same message. End of 2021, now we're saying early 2022. So give me a few months, it's okay. Okay. All right, we have been consistent about the timing. Our competitors were not consistent. We are consistent with the timing since 2016. So what are you excited about then? What's the I, next landmark? I think the biggest landmark is the fact that you can have here two revolutions. One revolution is life-saving. You know, the more autonomous cars on the road, the more lives will be saved. And the second revolution is a revolution of transportation. The fact that you can offer mobility at prices that rival public transportation. This is, and public transportation are, is subsidized, as, as we all know. This is the, the real promise of uh, autonomous driving, the ability to level the playing field of mobility. We're talking about a cost per mile that is, today, today ride hailing is 30% lower than uh, taxis. We're talking about 50% lower than that. And if we have ride sharing, 50% lower than, than that as, as well. It's a revolution of, uh, of mobility. I think this is, this is exciting. The world of transportation 10 years from now will look like nothing, nothing we can imagine today.